Thank you. For me, um, let's talk a little bit about myself first uh, and how I got here. Uh, I've been a strength and conditioning coach. I grew up in um, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Um, I've been I've had the pleasure of working in four different countries now at this point. Uh, and this this moment now in, in my career, I think things have come. Um, I've started to funnel and combine myself to, to, to this moment here, living in Mexico. Uh, as you see here, uh, the exp explanation with these images are, my, my daughter was born, uh, the oldest one was born on uh, I was in Montreal Impact. We played the Champions League final against Club America, and she, she was born on the second, uh, the day of the second leg on the, on the final. And actually she, she, she came to this uh, earth at 4.07 p.m. And I made it to the stadium by 6 p.m. Uh, I have a very supportive wife in that sense that uh, she knew that she had to get the baby out to make sure I get to the game in time. Um, you know, I see this face of mine after the, after the final. I was really disappointed, of course, being so close. But, you know, when you start to look at the other pictures in this image, you know, of my daughter uh, and my daughter's in Azteca and my daughter in front of the trophy that I could say lost or won. I could say it each way. It makes me happy to see that. Um, it does hit me every day when I walk by this trophy case and I see that trophy of 2015, but uh, it, it reminds me of the importance of every moment. So let's talk about uh, the game. Let's talk about the energy system development first. Ah, uh, bueno, pero esos no sé si si están allá. Need some mics, I think. Yeah, hold hold on a second. Jules, can you get that, please? All right, sorry. Go ahead, Paul. All right, no problem. So what's important is to talk about the game, okay? When we're preparing and training, we need to understand what is the maximum expression of our game. And when we talk about the match, we understand that, you know, the total distance ran is looking at around 11 kilometers uh, per hour, of course, for different levels, you know, that range goes up or down. And then when we start looking and breaking it down, high intensity running, uh, which is different classifications, whether it's 20 kilometers per hour or 50 kilometers per hour, we're looking at the 800 to 1200 meter range, uh, where sprinting is about 300 meters of that, okay? Uh, and a high intensity running, uh, high intensity run happens once every 70 seconds, okay? We're ne near max velocity, so if, and excuse me, I speak in kilometers per hour, you know, hitting 30 to 34 kilometers per hour for a top professional player happens once every three to four minutes, and not more than that. But those average efforts are about 60 meters and two to three seconds each. With the ball, 2% of that is covered uh, with the ball, okay? So 98% of the time, we are without the ball running uh, these high-intensity actions. High-intensity actions refer to jumps, sprints, changes of directions, and those happen 150 to 250 times a game. So let's break down a little bit more of the high-intensity run aspect of things. Those runs range from 5 to 30 meters. With the most intense period in a five-minute period would be around 300 meters uh, cumulative where that would be seven bouts, you know, over 111 seconds. That means one per 16 seconds. A repeated sprint bout is referred to three sprints within a 60 second period. And that only happens actually one to two times per game, not as often as we think, okay? Many of the actions are not classified as high intensity as they do not reach that 19 and 20 kilometers per hour. And 16% of that load actually comes from short accelerations or decelerations that do not hit that classification. So when you talk about high, high intensity exercises, it might be just stepping two, three steps. We might not hit max velocity or close to it, but our acceleration or peak acceleration would be very high. So if you see the greater percentage of run between the, the greater ones are between 10 to 15 and five to 10 meters for each effort. So what happens with the ball? Okay, I, I mentioned it as 2% you're actually spending 191 meters traveling with the ball at, uh, and, and for wide midfielder being the most is at around 286 meters. Of that total distance, 34% of that is above that 19 to 20 kilometers per hour and 26% is above that 14 to 20 kilometers per hour. And the length of the runs with the ball um, are, are about four meters and two touches per possession. So, what is the most demanding segment of a match? And I think that's really important to understand too, because you are preparing for those most uh, demanding moments. Those are the moments when goals are scored or goals against. 
And when we look at that in, in a one minute segment for midfielders and wide midfielders, we're looking at that 200 meters per minute uh, range. These numbers are just gonna start to make more sense as we get down into the further slides and we start planning our training. So keep in mind that 200 meter per minute uh, range. So the central defenders are the lowest. And here's an example of a high intensity run by Guido Rodriguez, you know, hitting 20 kilometers per hour, 29 kilometers per hour. And if we were to put some clips of him together, there'd be many, many moments of him um, doing things like this on the attacking and defending side of things. All right. So what is the fitness levels between, between players? Um, when we're looking at the yo-yo intermittent recovery test as a measure, using the level one, which is uh, starting at a lower speed, you can see the difference from the fullbacks and wide midfielders in their success in that performance test. But once we start using the yo-yo intermittent recovery two test, you start seeing a leveling off in the performance levels. And that just gives, a, gives you an idea that the central defenders and attackers had that recovery ability. So what happens in the yo-yo intermittent recovery two is you start at a higher speed, the test is a lot shorter, the endurance capacity is not the only factor that's involved in this test, but the anaerobic capacity is influenced. So that's why there's a little bit more of a leveling off. Uh, when you look at uh, GPS information, uh, regardless of position, if you were a central uh, defender, but you were placed on a fullback position, you do meet those demands of the match, meaning you do increase your high intensity running and your total distance. Uh, the position does uh, dictate the amount of uh, effort expressed in the match. So how fit do we really need to be to play this game? Okay, when we look at the max VO2, and that's the marker of aerobic fitness of elite players, you're seeing that range between 55 to 65 milliliters per kilogram per minute. But when you look at other high uh, level athletes, whether it's cross country skiers or elite runners or cyclists, you start seeing numbers in the high 70s and 80s in terms of uh, endurance uh, capacity. Now, how fit do we really need to be? You know, you don't need to be that fit to, to, to play football, but in order to play football, you need to actually have a certain level of fitness to make that intensity uh, and that effort, perceived effort to be lower. So let's look at match running performance because a lot of people, when they start looking at their GPS data and they're saying, you know, more running is good or bad, when you really look at the, um, the research, you start to see teams who run more generally have less possession. And what happens is those teams who run generally um, more are actually lower on the table when you look at the Serie A and EPL uh, statistics. But teams that are more successful actually have higher intensity running with the ball. So that's an interesting stat. So when they are actually working or, or running at high intensity, they're actually making productive actions. So over the last 10 years, when you're looking at high intensity running in this study from 2006 to 2013, there was an increase by 30% of high intensity running um, over uh, that period of time from 890 meters to almost uh, 1200 meters. You know, in the last seven years, I'm sure that's increased another uh, great percentage. I mean, we saw that in the last uh, recent World Cup and how important high intensity aspect of our game really is. So when I talk about density of our game, uh, one of the things I do talk about quite often is how much high intensity running in terms of percentage into uh, the total distance. So why, if we don't need to be that fit or extremely fit to play the game, uh, why, why are we doing endurance training or why are we doing uh, aerobic training? Well, when you start looking at some of the studies that looks at uh, the ability of technical ability uh, of players that are fitter, you start seeing a reduction in errors. And that's what, what makes the difference. So looking at this study here from Impelizeri, um, using a soccer simulated uh, test, four times four minutes with three minutes recovery, there was a great improvement in yo-yo intermittent recovery uh, test by 20% actually. And what we saw is that the players made less errors in short passes after the simulation. So that's what we're getting at. We want to be fitter to be more successful at the technical actions that we're actually accomplishing during a match. So how do we apply energy system development? Everything is energy system development. So let's take a look at that in the next slide. You know, we always divided things in three pathways, you know, whether it's ATP, CPC system, like, like a lot of analytic system, the aerobic system. But in the end, the truth of the matter is, and what we see in the next slide is that 
it's a continuum. You know, in football, it's not just one area. It's not constant exercise. It's not just high intensity exercise. It's a combination of factors. So when we train, we actually train along the continuum. There is no uh, black and white and say, well, if you're only doing exercise for one minute at this intensity, well, then you're hitting this. Well, you need to be a little bit flexible within the, the continuum of uh, the energy system uh, contribution to your exercise. So we see that the aerobic system is very important because with repeated sprints and looking at this uh, study, you can see that the aerobic contribution becomes more as the repeated sprints become uh, frequent or cumulative. When you're looking at the first sprint, 40% of that energy comes from glycolysis. From the 10th sprint, now 40% becomes uh, aerobic contribution. So it's important to understand why we're, we're, we're uh, training the endurance factors so that those high intensity actions can be repeated at a higher level. Okay. So now I'm going to dive in a little bit of the methodology that I like to apply. Again, um, this is definitions stolen. We're, we're the best thieves as coaches. We take things from the people that we've learned and put it together in a way that makes sense to us. And now in my position right now, in a way that I need to make it make sense to the coaches and um, fitness staff and therapy staff as well. So this is probably the most important slide you're going to have here in this presentation today. So I really want you to pay attention to this. And this is actually the foundation of everything that um, when we design our training sessions. So I've created a pyramid of energy system development zones. So like the first zone, okay, the base of that zone is basic endurance sessions. Okay, We're, we're talking about your very light exercise. You know, you see here 60 to 70% max heart rate. It's uh, well below uh, match intensity when it comes to meters per minute or below 80 meters per minute. And then we start moving into the, the exercises or the zones that we would probably plan uh, with, more, uh, with more aim. So when we look at zone two, these are now aerobic capacity uh, sessions. So we don't talk in terms of aerobic capacity, endurance, max aerobic power. We talk in terms of zone one, zone two, and then we'll go through the other zones as well. Now the, the rhythm is more moderate. We're looking at a higher heart rate. Uh, we're looking at 80 to 100 meters per minute in terms of, uh, in terms of rhythm of match. Because when we took a look at zone three, zone three, you'll see that 100 to 120 meters per minute. Now this is the match. When we play the match, the average intensity is about that 100 to 120 meters per minute. When you play a 90 minute match and you, and you do the math and you run 10 kilometers, you're gonna be hitting this on average. So that's where it's really important. So when you look at the um, uh, zone two and zone one, you're looking at below competition and well below competition and zone three at competition rhythm. So when we touch zone four now, we're looking at max aerobic power. So now we're looking at threshold intensity. So it's a little bit higher than match. We're hitting above 120 meters per minute. The heart rate is quite high and it's more intermittent in nature. And zone five is my last one where we're looking at speed endurance. So this is max effort, you know, above 75% max sprint speed or 130% max aerobic speed and greater than 200 meters per minute in terms of playing rhythm. So have a look at that. That dotted blue line is really important because now we start talking about, you know, the anaerobic contribution above that in zone four and zone five, where it's a greater contribution of the aerobic component in zone three, two, and one. So here we have three methods that we like to apply and, and it's tools. You know, there are moments when you work without the ball, there are moments when you work within the technical aspect and there's moments when you work in a competition or game situation. For me, right now, there's an equal representation, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's what I believe in. I mean, there are moments where a technical representation will be a little bit higher. There are moments where competition or game situation needs to be higher. And there are moments where we thought the ball will be higher. Like right now, what we're living right now in our situation uh, with uh, our, our lockdown situation. So exercises with the ball, what are we talking about here? You're talking about jogging, tempo runs, high intensity interval training. You know, things to consider when you design these types of sessions are, do you include change of direction? What is the setup? What are the elements of your setup? What space do you have? What surface are you using? Is there an incline or no incline whatsoever? Now, technical exercises, now we start talking about a little bit more fun. This is where the players really start to enjoy themselves. Um, you're involving dribbling, passing, controlling, heading, kicking, crossing. When dribbling a ball for the same speed of running, we're looking at an energy cost of 10% more. So you get a little more bang for your buck, but the effort has to be there. 
we do need to keep in mind that fatigue and technical reproducibility is important. Um, you know, if you do have a breakdown in technique, you need to understand that that's going to be probably a compromise that you decide when you choose these types of sessions. Uh, it doesn't mean it's a good thing or a bad thing. It just means it has to be part of your plan. And obviously, players enjoy it and, and you're hiding the physical demand. Game, game situation exercises. This is where we do most of our work, of course, where you know we're talking about anything from 1v1 to 2v2 to 11v11, superiority or inferiority in numbers, uh, exercises with waves of competition. You know, when we look at studies, we're talking about small-sided games, it shows to be effective of placing a greater percentage of uh, heart rate uh, above 95%. So that's why it's really important because there is a neuromuscular and a cognitive component that adds to that effort. And that is why you get a higher intensity running. But what you need to understand is where are you placing that in your session, in your, in your planning, and what are the, the elements that you're, you're trying to accomplish? Because at times when things are not planned properly, you do not achieve that greater percentage of heart rate that, or near max heart rate. So when you're looking at training prescription, these are the elements that you, you need to add up. You know, when you're talking about the work intensity, the duration, the recovery, uh, the recovery duration, number, number of repetition sets, the recovery between the sets, total volume, work mode, environment. If, if you don't put all these pieces together um, in your plan, you're, you're, you're definitely missing out. And when you're talking about periodization of planning, you're looking at what factors here are you actually uh, manipulating. So what we're going to do is when we go look at the zones in the following slides, we're going to always go back to this type of framework to understand what is the intensity, what is the duration, what is the intensity of the recovery, and the duration of the recovery as well. Okay. Now we'll talk about zone one. Zone one, um, we don't really need to plan that much because most of our exercises actually fall in, fall in that place. I just wanna, wanna remove something here on my screen, sorry about that. All right. Sorry, Steve, I just need to put that back. Okay. Ah, there we go. Perfect. So what we're looking at uh, is just those basic endurance exercises. So when we're talking about zone one is your regeneration sessions, your warm up, your cool down, technical work in place and rehabilitation work in your first, just to create volume. Um, this is not necessarily the work that's going to make the difference and we'll talk about that later on as we go further in the zones but you know your intensity is below 70 percent uh, max heart rate yeah the duration is an exercise that lasts 12 minutes per segment very easy and if you're gonna have a couple blocks one to two minutes is enough to recover so if you pay attention to the chart at the bottom there um, that dotted line is your hundred percent of max aerobic speed that's something that we, we learn or achieve through some, um, some testing. And you can see here well below that number. Just pay attention to that gray bar on the width of the bar and the height of the bar as well as we go through further than the next zones. So as I said, without the ball, that's one of our tools. We're talking about jogging here and, and very simple. Um, one thing that I'd like to say is for one, is I like to avoid using this as often as possible. For me, it's not necessarily a warm up activity every single day. I like to limit it to one or two days a week on certain days where I just want them to relax a little bit, but it's actually uh, more of a regenerative uh, type of session, not an activation type of session for me. So when we go to the technical side, is any technical exercise, and you guys have many options that you've, you, you've done, is anything in place, anything with limited movement, there obviously is a heart rate um, can, uh, elevation, but not high enough to start really changing your road capacity. And game competition, we all love to play foot tennis, whether it's 2v2 or 3v3. That's also another activity, and that's why you'll see it on many fields as a regeneration activity, uh, day or post match. Zone two is now when we start getting into a little bit more intensity. Okay, we start looking at 70 to 85% of max road speed, uh, 8 to 100 uh, meters per minute. So the activities that include our fart legs or tempo runs or technical circuits, then when you move from one to the next, uh, you know, small sided games or medium side to large side, larger sided games with 8v8 or greater with uh, 100 to 150 meters squared per player. 
The reason why is that distance needs to be moderate, not super high, and not super low to have too many changes of directions or actions, but alternating activities. One of the biggest tests to understand the difference between the zone two and zone three is that if you can do that segment of exercise for six minutes or greater, it most likely probably is a zone two exercise. All too often is that some people train too low of an intensity, okay, and they think they're actually doing a zone three or zone four exercise, and of course you're not achieving those types of intensities if you can prolong that exercise for that given period of time. So again, look at those bars at the bottom where you see if we had two segments, now we're starting to approach that dotted line uh, in those two gray line, two gray blocks at the bottom over time. Okay. So without the ball, a simple fart like here. Uh, if you go to the one without the ball, sorry first is going to be a, a run, a triangle run at 60% effort with a harder run at uh, 90 to 100% effort. So this is actually part of our home program right now uh, with the players so that they can manipulate any given space. So the whole idea is, you know, you're going to do 40 to 50 seconds at, uh, at a lower moderate pace and 10 to 15 seconds at a higher pace. Here's an example using the ball. So, for example, if you have two players or one player versus a wall, you will do a technical action part again for that 10 to 15 seconds with a moderate rate run all the way 20 meters away, 20 meters back, trying to manipulate that 10 to 15 seconds hard, 45 seconds to 50 seconds at a moderate pace. You're not, you're not recovering by any means. What you're trying to do is keep a moderate pace by alternating activities adding those little spikes of, uh, of intensity just keeps that heart rate uh, honest and not, uh, and not exert, exerting yourself too much. Like I mentioned now in the game situation is when you start talking about games where you start limiting spaces and where players are confined to certain spaces, you're definitely gonna achieve that because now they do not have the running load. They do not have the high intensity running load. As you see, as the ball moves to one section, the other two sections are, are kind of are recovering or putting themselves in place. So are either possession games where they're limited to their space and you have maybe two or three mini goals on each side. One of the favorite ones that we had on day one in Miami, for example, was a 50 meter length by 60 meter wide, uh, 10 v 10, just playing to the three mini goals. And that would keep us, you know, in a moderate level. So now the fun starts in zone three. This is now where you're starting to work, okay? This is where it's your classic four times four minutes like you saw in that study uh, by Impelizeri. You know, you're looking at interval lengths from two to six minutes with an intensity of 85 to 100% of max or speed. Okay? You, your volume here is gonna be uh, anywhere from eight to 24 work minutes. Um, and that, that's important to keep in mind that effective load and your rest in between that will always be uh, working with one to one or two to one. So that way you do not over recover and, and maintain a higher heart rate. And I can see you're working at or close to that dotted line, which is that max aerobic speed line. So without the ball, your classic, and this is actually the most boring is when we're talking about the, you know, you're doing your 800 meters and 1000 meter runs that a lot of people love to do. But obviously we have more options than just doing that. You know, uh, when I do this in terms of time, um, I do four times four minutes. Everybody has their specific distance to meet. And this is when you do a session like this, you want to avoid changes of direction. That's your plan. You have, you have a, and you're, you're doing a purely cardiovascular uh, impact type session. So when you're looking at now doing things with the ball, okay, we're looking at exercises. Um, um, such as a dribble trap. This one right now is part of our home program with players where they have three different salt slaloms with ladders. They are dribbling the ball throughout the whole period of time at a moderate to higher intensity. Uh, and they're doing this for three minutes constant. And doing that repetitive for three minutes is a high enough load. Um, they probably have a hard time maintaining it past six minutes that, that the speed that we're required. But definitely, you know, hitting that two to four minute range would be a, a really adequate load for them in this type of intensity of exercise. No. So we gotta move to the next slide. So here are the examples with game situation. Game situation, for example, if you've played a 4v4 with mini goals like, on, like you see on the left, 
that is definitely zone three exercise. And all too often, when it, what is done poorly on our end is the, the the load that we actually put per set. So doing this for two to three minutes to start and progressing it to three, four minutes later on is actually a good progression. You know, most of the time when we start hitting five or six minutes, seven minutes doing this type of exercise, you're not needing the intensity that you're looking for. So remember here we start talking about quality over quantity and we want to make sure that we hit the right intensity and start maintaining that action. On the, on the right, we start looking at a similar, obviously similar load, but 2v2 with bumpers. Um, I'm sure you've done this many times where you see the breakdown in technical actions start happening easily in the one and a half or two minute range. So you want to maintain it right around that range and keep moving from there and not that much further on from there. So let's go looking at zone four. This is where I start to have a lot of fun. And, you know, one of the conversations I had here with my fitness coaches and my staff is that the exercises, when they felt that they were doing these intermittent exercises, they weren't meeting the high intensity demand that is possible from these types of sessions. So remember, now we're starting to work at above a max aerobic speed. One, you need to understand what that is first. But when you're starting to hit 120% max aerobic speed, it's quite quite hard and, and that was kind of the response from the, the staff is like well it's very very difficult well that's the whole idea we want this exercise to be very difficult and that's why we created intermittent in nature and not allowing too much recovery so one to one one to two i don't really like too much and two to one in terms of rest work to rest allow doesn't allow for enough for the heart rate to return back to that 120 130 level you want it to keep it high because the lower your heart rate goes in this type of exercise, the harder you have to work or the more often you have to work to get a cumulative effect to get the, uh, to hit the, the red zone, as people would say, is above 90, 95% max, max heart rate. So less rest is good if you're maintaining the intensity that you want. If you're not maintaining the intensity that you want, you need to really consider what is the intensity or the appropriate intensity for that player or that exercise. So. We're looking at interval lengths from 10 to 45 seconds. So in turn, the recovery is going to be the same, whether it's a one-to-one. -one. So if it's a 20-20, you're going to go 20 on, 20 off. So keep in mind that you want to have as many uh, intervals as possible per set to get that commutative effect without a drawback in terms of intensity or performance uh, from your players. So as you see, the total work does go down. Um, here in effective work, we're looking at you know two to 16 minutes. And where do these numbers come from is because if you start looking at the amount of time spent at that speed, so let's say 10 minutes at running at five meters per second, okay, you're going to look at, uh, you're looking at about 1800 meters probably at high intensity running for your session. And that's what you've got to think about, you know, in terms of matching that match demand. So when we looked at well, that high intensity running component, we're looking at anywhere from 1000 to 2000 meters, depending on level of competition or depending on which threshold you're observing for your players. So let's look at the examples that we have now. So without the ball, your typical block, box to box, 15 on, 15 off. And I think you need to really be careful with that. And, and the measurement, and, and this is one of the things that I've caught uh, working with different groups, is that the same measurement and same time for each group is not appropriate. Because for one group, for my U15s, 75 meters might be enough, but that might not be enough for the U20s. So the 20s, you know, you're looking at maybe 85 to 90 meters. So it's important to understand what is that max orbit speed and calculate it. And I even have the differences within your group. And that is what, what is the benefit of sessions like this without the ball is that you can start really having everybody have their own specific intensity to work at. Uh, well, not intensity, but, you know, effort is going to be the same throughout. So 120 max orbit speed for a player who has the highest endurance capacity versus the one who has lowest. The only difference is going to be the distance travel over that period of time. So that's what you need to observe so that you get a matching heart rate and you get a matching effort for each of those players. So technical exercises here, this one's part of our home program right now. It's a dribble and drop where the players are sprinting high intensity running for 10 meters. Then what they're doing is they're leaving the ball, running without the ball, running with the ball. That change of action, but over that period of time where one loop is 15 seconds and they do it twice is 30 seconds that would be an intermittent activity. So they do 30 seconds hard, 30 seconds rest, and repeat that four to six times to make it one set. And they would do probably four to five sets, depending on where they are in the program at the moment. How do we accomplish that in competition? There's many different ways, okay? And one on the left is an example where 
one player is dribbling the ball, the other one's running and coming back to going into uh, 1v1 or 2v2, okay? Those are examples that really you can design yourself quite a bit. So if you have one player with the ball, one player without the ball, in this example in the animation, they only show the two players traveling, we could have two players going and, and you don't want to overdo the amount of players because what happens then is that they already feel like they're not part of the work so they don't meet the intensity that you're looking for. So getting the right distance, okay? And here it doesn't really show, but that distance is actually over 50 meters, okay? Uh, we're looking into half field and back to get back into the competition, okay? On the right side, here's more of a playing style where it's 3v3 uh, running outside those flags. It's about a 50 to 60 meter run going into a 3v3 game. So if you want to cap it at 15, 20, or 30 seconds, you can do that to start meeting those demands and the next group would go in. So obviously setup is going to be important here. So if you have six players and uh, for, for side, uh, you definitely need to have two setups that have a team of 24, okay? If you do have a team of 18, so you're going to have to think about doing it from one to two or doing another activity with a similar one-to-one -one action before you come back in here. And that's where your creativity and your staff becomes very important is how do you apply these things. So even with the staff uh, that I've worked in, we've actually even done these zone type of four exercises using tactical work. Tactical work when you're looking at whether it was a pressing situation for a big period of time with intermittent rest or a coming out of the box situation um, with intermittent rest as well. Zone five, um, this is nobody's favorite, but probably mine, because this is where people start to really start feeling sick, and this is where you start to feel the accomplishment. I think one of the shockers for, for my staff here is that they thought that they were hitting these types of intensities, and they've never seen that before, and they said that uh, it, it, this is actually the new baptism, because now we're starting to have a count of how many players we've had puke over the last little while, so... Uh, these are exercises and there's different ways of approaching speed endurance. One, the most important thing is that the intensity is at max of effort. Uh, when we start talking about production, as you see in the three formats, you're looking at intervals from 20 to 30 seconds, even up to 60 seconds with a work to rest ratio of one to five. What happens here is that effort is as hard as you can for that period of time. And obviously you're not going to do the same volume and you're not going to do the same amount of um, uh, repetitions because when you start hitting repetitions two, three, four, you're definitely spent and you're actually maybe even sick. And what the difference is between production and maintenance is the exercise is the same, but the work to rest becomes diminished to maintain that intensity or maintain that buffering uh, a level. Then the third one, which is more fun for, for most people is the repeated sprint ability. And now we're looking at actions at three to 10 seconds with a rest of 10 to 60 seconds, okay? With the, so keeping that work rest one to two or even to one to four. What's really, really important is the speed of the action. And if there's a pacing strategy happening in that repeated sprint ability, that is actually a poor execution of the exercise. So that, as, per, as a coach, we need to keep an eye on that and we need to make sure that the exercise is designed appropriately. So for example, dribbling for that three to four seconds might not um, create enough speed. So that's why some of these actions here, as you're gonna see later on, is just a small, ball action or, or a partial dribble action, but it's important to really come by and make sure that you hit that high intensity speed. So when you look above, now we're talking about like greater than 200 meters per minute. So if we're looking at a 1v1 exercise uh, over a, a large space, you're gonna see, you're gonna start hitting that kind of uh, threshold, okay? So let's go and look at some examples. Um, I did discuss a little bit about the difference between production, maintenance, and repeated sprint ability, okay? Keep in mind these work to rest ratios and you see like the total load for a session for a speed and dirt production session, effective load might be only a minute to two minutes. So four times 30 seconds is that. So that, you know, if we did like a four times 45 seconds 2v2, now we're starting to hit that three minute range. So we need to start keeping in mind um, that repeated sprint ability is even higher. So the work, uh, total work is actually gonna be a little bit lower than the speed endurance production or maintenance work. So let's go look at those graphs in the next slide. Okay, let's look at the difference between the three. They're all all out, but as you see further to the right, the repeated sprint ability, you can achieve a greater speed because of the shortness of the action. Where the speed endurance production and speed endurance maintenance, they're about the same in terms of the speed above uh, max aerobic speed, but you see the difference in recovery between the bars. 
and that's where that becomes a difference maker. And where you apply it and how you apply it is going to be your choice and be really very important. For me, I barely touch any speed endurance maintenance sessions. Those sessions happen um, as little quick starters uh, towards the end of the season to maintain a little bit of work. The great part of zone five work, okay, um, is that with minimal work, you do have an impact in your aerobic uh, capacity. And that's why it's important to look at those zone four and zone fives. And those are the most important types of sessions for me. So zone five is part of um, the training plan and maybe 30, 40% of the weeks that we work. So let's look at a session without the ball. On the left, okay, we have a competition between two players with some deceleration zones. What happens is there's actually 12 meters between the first red cone and the first blue cone. 12 meters again between the two zones, 12 meters to the last red cone. So that makes it about 40 meters coming back. And that's about 15 to 17 seconds at full effort. Um, those start and stops actually cause an extra effort for the players and an extra energy consumption. You know, when we look at it in terms of repeated sprint ability, we'd probably have a short sprint over, you know, 10 meters there and back. You know, uh, on the box here showing about 20 meters. That's a little bit long, but there and back, resting for, so if it was there and back and it took them about seven seconds, you're looking at resting 15 to even up to 30 seconds as you're repeating that based on your plan. And then repeating that, you know, six to eight times per set. So let's go look at uh, the technical exercises. This is my favorite exercise and some of you who've seen it at the convention, I've seen it in, in, uh, in work is where you have four players uh, on the outside uh, with one player doing the work in the middle. So this is what makes it easy to do that one to four to five kind of work to rest ratio, where they're making a pass to the outside, okay, sprinting around that player and another player and receiving the ball on the other end. What happens there is, there, it's about, you're looking at seven or eight times, seven or eight seconds to get back to the middle every time. So we're talking about a 30 second overall in a 15 by 15 grid. Um, depending on the age group, you know, we're, I'll play with 13 to up to 17 meters per meter, uh, grid per side. Switching over to repeated sprint ability, okay? It was like the sprinting exercise, but now you would go sprint in, put the ball through a gate, put the ball back and sprint back out. And if you had a partner or a wall, you probably would do the pass and stop and go back out. So you need to be creative in what you do. So right now, the, this is actually in our home program. So that's why I have it like that where the players by themselves. So now how do we accomplish that in the most fun is in competition and games. On the, on the left, we have an example of a 1v1 uh, where there's four balls that will be played. So you play the first ball, then based on a number, they go to that corner looking for the other ball, going back and playing. So based on the number of balls that you play, if you play four balls about over, uh, and this was a 40 meters by 20 meter space, you're gonna probably get into about 30 seconds. And again, it doesn't have to be perfect. We're that range 25 seconds. It depends on what you design and then progress from there. That's why it's important to take a lot of notes in terms of the measurement of your fields, the number of balls used, and then timing these exercises and then keeping that in a record for yourself and, and see where you're going to progress from there. On the right, okay, uh, this exercise here is uh, a fun one for most. It's a 1v1 with a sprint around the field and then whoever puts their flag or cone on the flag, they receive the ball first and going into a 1v1. Um, you can manipulate the distance of the field by making it a little bit longer. You can make it two laps versus one lap, and that would be less technical action. Then you can decide how long that the playing action is. So in a 20 by 20 to do this, uh, the sprint will be around eight seconds. And if you want to keep it to going to about 20 seconds, you're going to make them play for 12 seconds. So you probably have two or three balls played in afterwards. Now, repeated sprint ability, remember, we want those actions from three to 10 seconds. So variations of receiving and finishing from different angles uh, and changing that will be really important. And you'll see that on the, on the left versus the right, okay? Where you're coming from and what you're seeing and where you're finishing, whether it's the small goal or large goal. What's important here is to keep in mind you want three to 10 second action, no further than that rest about 15 to 20 seconds depending on what that work part was and repeating it as many times as keeping that intensity as possible. 
Now we can move to the next one. So I think uh, I threw a lot at you in, in a short period of time because for me, what's really important is giving an opportunity to discuss each of the things. For me, seeing a presentation has very little meaning in terms if you don't have an opportunity to discuss the context. So final thoughts here are, let's, what are your object objectives in the session? You know, is it purely a cardiovascular objective of that portion of the session? Is there an anaerobic component? Do you want a neuromuscular component and where does that happen? One of the biggest points for me is coaching motivation. Like where is your voice in the session? And your voice will dictate that. So for example, if I'm doing a zone two session, my voice is going to be very somber, very light, because I do not want them to overexert themselves. Or a zone three session that I need four or five intervals that I need to pace themselves, or in a playing style where they pace themselves too much and I need to go as hard as possible. You see in the studies that coaching motivation is the biggest difference maker in, in increasing heart rate. You know, at times people think it's the rules of the small-sided games that make the difference, but no, it's coaching motivation that makes the difference. So your setup of having the balls where they need to be, your voice in, in, in terms of being uh, on top of the players and being very constructive and very aggressive with the, your voice will make that difference. So the order and combination of exercises are very important as well, because let's say you don't have enough players and you need to create a manipulation, you need to consider, am I going from easier to harder in my session and then I want a lower end at my session or not? Maybe you want the hardest part at the end of the session, like the zone five exercises at times um, or the combination. Sometimes I will have a zone three and zone four session kind of combined where you have two groups in each half of the field and a fitness coach dealing with one and a coach and assistant coach dealing with the other. That all becomes up to you in terms of your design and what your goals and objectives are. So considering the space uh, uh, per player in small-sided games, I really recommend that you start uh, measuring your fields, whether it's yards or meters, that doesn't make a difference to me, but keeping that you know, area per player uh, considered. So pace your field, write down the numbers, and you should do it yourself. The thing is this is when you start asking other people to measure the field and do it for you, things are changing. and and. I always ask, you know, maybe somebody to do it, but I ended up doing it myself, to be honest. And, and that's where you start getting a little bit confident in what um, setups, unless it's actually a very clear distance, like a double box. A double box, you know, is going to be 33 meters by 40 meters. I think that's where you start basing that, um, uh, that measurement. So reading. I know this period of time uh, has been... A lot of reading, a lot of lectures such as this for everyone in this period of time. Um, but one of the greatest tools is if you go into Google Scholar and you start quoting any of these topics,